If you have your Bibles with you tonight, let's open to the book of Exodus. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So a lot of the things that we're learning are principles that, that they don't change because man doesn't change much either with his heart. And uh, so God still works a lot of things the same way. So Exodus 25, verse 1. Exodus 25, verse 1. We're going to start covering a lot more ground so we won't be getting into all the details. There's a lot of details here, but um, we kind of could really get bogged down if we tried to, uh, to go th- with all the details. If you want to do that, you can go back and do a detailed study of the book of Exodus. We are getting uh, some of the big picture, so you'll notice that tonight. Let me pray for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for speaking to us. And Father, it's always good to learn lessons at somebody else's expense. <laughs> and I mean, you know, when we look at Israel and we see their, them struggle, Lord, we, it reminds us of ourselves. But it also, Lord, reminds us that, God, what you can do, what you're willing to do. So teach us again tonight through this nation, Lord, uh, that you drew toward you and uh, wanted to covenant with and uh, bring that home to us, Lord, tonight, we pray. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here we go, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Remember that he's still up on the mountain. And the children of Israel have been being led by God for 50 days now, 50 days plus. Now we're at the time where God meets with them and wants relationship with them. And uh, he brings them to the mountain, the mountain of Sinai, And it's where they come face to face with God and they enter into a covenant. So he's laying all the foundation for everything in their society in relationship to him and with one another. And he's going to ask them to say, now are you with me? Are we going to covenant in this uh, relationship? And uh, so that's what they're doing. So it's been 50 days and um, they have received the Ten Commandments, the ordinances, which are a lot of the laws that would be the, uh, uh, the governing laws for their society. Just covered all of those. And then also the annual feasts. Three times he wants to have a, a celebration and a feast with them. And he laid out the details for that. And then he promised them, he said, listen, if, if you let me lead you through my angel, which is Jesus himself, um, who has his name, he says, you'll never lose ever won victory. I'll fulfill everything that I have promised you. And, uh, and, and I mean, you talk about a great relationship. Um, if all, all we got to do is let God lead. Same thing with our lives, right? If we'll just do that one thing, God, you get to be the leader. I'm going to follow you. I'll obey you. It's easy to say, not so easy to do. But if we are willing to do that, what's God going to do? Hey, listen, You'll be victorious in all that you do. Wait till we hear him talk to Joshua. Joshua's like, I'm afraid. He said, listen, if you'll meditate on my word day and night, you will have success. You all will be with you. You'll win the victory. And Joshua did it. And so we know that we can do it uh, too. So he's given them all of those promises and they responded by saying, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. You guys know that song? I didn't sing it. I just said it. My wife says, you sing too much when you, when you teach. Um, no, nah, she didn't say too much, but she says, you're always singing a song. So I didn't sing that one. I just gave the words. But yes, Lord, yes. So they're all on board. At least they're saying that at this point. Now, let's skip down to verse 8. So Moses is still there, and God says, listen, I've got some, some more things to explain to you. And uh, so he's speaking to him. And one of the things he's saying is, I, w- I, w- I want you to build a house for me. He calls it a sanctuary, but it's where God's going to dwell. And verse 8 says, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Well, what a humbling thing. God's willing to come and dwell with us. This is just an interesting word, dwell. It means tabernacle, and that's what we're learning about, the tabernacle. But 
um, God says, listen, I, I want to dwell with you. I want to have a relationship with you. Now, we're going to look at all the aspects of this tabernacle, and when we do that, we're going to see how we enter into relationship with God, and we get to have the tabernacle with him and fellowship with him. But just the word tabernacle is interesting because we know that God dwelt in the tabernacle. He dwelt in the temple, and it was an earthly dwelling, an earthly home where they could meet and fellowship with God. But then that changed when Jesus came. The Bible says God became flesh, and then he dwelt among us. That was in 2,000 years ago. And dwelt means the same thing, tabernacled with us. So now God was with man, walking amongst him, building relationship. Then, of course, Jesus died on the cross, and he rose again. He said, but I'm going to send a comforter, a helper. And what's he going to do? He's going to be in you. He's going to tabernacle in you. So now when we come to faith in Jesus, God dwells in us. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So he dwells in us. So we have to think about that a little bit. But then let's stretch it out just a little bit more because that's not where it's going to end. We see here that Jesus, as he rose, though, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I, I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> We've got a home. This isn't it. But uh, God wants us to dwell with him in his house. So we're going to look at this tabernacle as an earthly house, but we're looking at all of these other things as well. One day in the new Jerusalem, right, that's what God says, listen, I'll be the center, and God will be there in the center uh, with his son, and we will have relationship with him forever. That's pretty exciting. So think about that as we talk about the tabernacle right uh, there. Now, if you can, if you're ambidextrous, ambidextrous, right, you can go ahead and hold your spot there and then flip over to Hebrews chapter 8. As we launch in here, we want to make sure we get the picture here. So he's setting up a home. I want you to, he says, I want you to put together a place for me to dwell with you. And that's this imagery that we're going to see. He's going to give us all kinds of details about what it looks like. And here's what this, this uh, room looks like. And then as you go into the Holy of Holies, here's what this room looks like. And here's what it represents. And all about the journey of coming into the presence of the Lord. So hold your hand, you know, where we're at next us, and then in Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to read this together. I didn't put this up on the screen. Uh, this this will get out of the Bible. But you want to see, this is a parallel passage to the Old Testament uh, book of Exodus. So here's what it says. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now, the main point in what has been said, this is what the writer of Hebrews is explaining. He says, we have such a high priest. So he's given, given a parallel of Jesus being our high priest in this tabernacle picture, right? Who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So where's Jesus now? He's with the Father in his home in heaven, in his throne room. And he says, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle. So here's what God's doing is he's saying, let me just give you a glimpse of what my home looks like. This is what dwelling around me would look like. So that's the true tabernacle where Jesus is now, which the Lord pitched, not man. In other words, this isn't the one that men built. This is the one from heaven. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Jesus didn't walk into the heavenly tabernacle, dwelling place of God, empty-handed. He brought his own blood, didn't he? His own sacrifice. He didn't come in empty-handed. Um, he sacrificed himself there. He says, now... 
If he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. There's an earthly tabernacle, and there's priests that go in there who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So what we're learning about is a copy and a shadow of heaven, of heavenly things. So God's given us a picture as they build this home. This is a picture of what one day God's going to invite all of us to come into his home and to dwell with him. So just as Moses warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, he said, see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Do it right because it's important. And, and there's details here that represent me and my home and my glory. And you need to be careful to do it the way that I've explained to you. And he says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, speaking of Jesus, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. We're going to see it's really difficult to get into the presence of God on this earthly scale here with Israel. In fact, only one guy was able to do it and only one time a year. And that was with a lot of preparation. And if one thing was wrong in all of that, even that one time a year, uh, God just killed him. And, and it was a, a way to see is that, listen, we can't get into God's presence um, with any blemishes, with any spots. Um, God's holy and his presence is holy. So now we got a better high priest, don't we? And now he says, come on in. You know, he welcomes us through the Lord Jesus. He's saying, hey, listen, come on in. Come on into my father. We're allowed to go into the throne room of God boldly and make our request to the Lord. Why? Because we're covered under the blood of Christ. And uh, so he, he lets us walk right in. I, I mean, when you think about that sometimes when you pray, if you don't think of it, you need to think of it. Because the Lord, through in the name of Jesus, now we get to talk to the Father directly, right into his presence and, and speak to the Father, and our Father which art in heaven, right? And we get to speak with him. So that's the picture here. This is a human creation of a heavenly picture. So try to remember that. And then if you can remember one other thing as we talk about the tabernacle, we're going to talk a lot about it. All of it points to Jesus. It's everything, inside, outside, gates, doors, everything is a picture there. So as you're thinking about it, think about how Christ has fulfilled us access in this way or how he's been the sacrifice, how he's cleansed us, how he's the light of the world, how he's the bread of life, how, all of those things as we think of the tabernacle, and this will help you a lot to see what the Lord is doing uh, for them. So back uh, to our text. So he says, listen, um, I want you to take an offering and gather a bunch of stuff so you can make this home for me. Now, he said something interesting. He said, from every man whose heart moves him, make a collection. God's not interested in you giving him anything begrudgingly. So he doesn't want it. Did God need materials to build a house on earth? He's like, I don't have anything, guys. You know, if you don't bring something, I, don't know, I, could, I can't have a house. He could have built his own house in one second. More beautiful than man could have ever built it. It would be heaven on earth. But he's allowing men to do this and make this picture, and he's allowing them to provide these things. And so if you don't have a heart when you give to the Lord that is moved by giving to him and with a joy of giving to him, he just says he's not interested in it. And there's no good in giving something that you give begrudgingly to God. Can you outgive God? I mean, can you give to him and say, now... Man, God, you owe me so much, and you know, you've ripped me off, God, because I've, no, never. And, uh, but if you ever give uh, to the Lord begrudgingly, um, listen, um, you will feel that way, because you're doing it, and you don't even want to do it, and the Lord says, man, I, I, I can't bless that. In fact, I mean, you might as well just take it back home with you, 
So uh, always want to have joy in giving to the Lord. So he, that's who he takes it from. And then he says, there's all kinds of things, gold, silver, bronze, uh, uh, blue, purple, and scarlet material. We'll see all of these things. Fine linen, goat hair, strange thing. Hey, could you get some goat hair for me on the way out? Uh, ram skins, uh, dyed red, porpoise skins, as we'll see. Like, uh, there's a couple different interpretations for that. Um, and then acacia wood, oil, lighting, spices, all of those things. Fragrance, for instance, we'll see where they all go. And then onyx stones uh, and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastplate. So we're going to look at all of these things. Where, 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 are they, where do they get them? They're slaves. The slaves have like, oh yeah, I got a little pouch of gold over here. No, they don't have that. But what did they do? They plundered Egypt, didn't they? And God made a point of it. I want you to go out, ask from your neighbor, and just tell them, hey, I'm, I'm heading out. Is there anything I, you could give me? And uh, they did that, and they gave them everything. And so they plundered them as they went out, so they have this supply. And God says, listen, you already got it to give. I'm asking you to give something you don't have. And, uh, and as you give it there, every, we'll have everything that we need. If everybody gives as the Lord moves their heart. And that's a great thing to remember. God's uh, perfect that way. So... Um, um, have you ever wondered why there is gold in the ground and precious stones and all that stuff hidden all over the earth and man has dug them up and he's made them his precious things and, and it's a commodity of gold that we see and, and diamonds and all of those things. Um, here's something that's interesting. Um, God's tucked away in the earth, think about this, some heavenly some heavenly uh, materials. And we interact with them while we're on this earth. You say, well, really? I mean, it's part of God's creation. It's gonna be in heaven? Yeah, it's gonna be in heaven. Let me just read you this verse. Revelation 21, 18 through 21. Here's what it says. The material of the wall was jasper, precious stone. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass, that's how pure it was. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone, jasper, sapphire, emerald, amethyst, etc., etc. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. So uh, very interesting, as he's pulling apart these resources, these are things we're going to see in heaven as well. Um, again, gold's not going to be so valuable in heaven, right? It's pavement. It's asphalt in heaven, okay? Uh, the precious things that the Lord says are, obviously, he loves people. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, um, heavenly products that begin here. Let's go down to verse 10. God's uh, gathering them. They shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, and one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. Now, a cubit is about 18 inches. So somewhere between 18 and 24 inches, but the common thing is usually about an 18 inch. So if you can do the math and you're good with measurements, then enjoy yourself. If you're not, I'll tell you kind of how many feet that is and you can uh, take it from there. So um, you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it, and fasten them on its four feet, and two rings shall be on one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold as well. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark and carry the ark within them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark, they shall not be removed from it. That's just going to always stay in there, ready to go. You shall put um, into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. So, a couple of things here. This is an ark. We're going to see it's the ark of the covenant, ark of the testimony, right? He's making a covenant with them, and the first thing he's telling them to put in is put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. So it's going to be in this box, and it's this box that's two and a half cubits long and 
one and a half cubits wide. So we're talking about four feet by two and a half feet. And uh, so it's not huge. It's not this massive thing, the Ark of the Covenant. But it's a box, and it's made out of acacia wood. And then all of it is overlaid with pure gold. So when you look at all of these articles that are inside the tabernacle, they're gold. It's the purity of the Lord. It's the holiness of the Lord. And so uh, even in the temple, it would be all the walls would be solid gold. But in the tabernacle, it will be tapestry. So it's pretty. Now, overlaid there. And, uh, and this is going to be in the Holy of Holies is where it's going to be. So um, this is a picture. Now, later on, they're going to put more things inside of it. They're going to put manna, a golden jar of manna, which we just talked about. We'll go in it. In fact, God has already told them that one day they're going to put it in this, but they don't even have an ark yet. So they're going to put that inside of there. And then they're also going to put the budded rod of Aaron as well in there. So each of those are really great pictures. Um, Jesus fulfills all of it, right? He fulfilled the law, which man couldn't fulfill by being perfect. He fulfilled the covenant that God had with man because man broke his covenant with God. So Jesus was the fullness of the covenant. He became man, and he fulfilled the covenant perfectly. So he's the fulfiller of the law, but he's also the bread of life. So he's the one who sustains us in every way. Um, and so that jar of manna, say, God, you're our sustenance. You're the bread of life. And then also with the budded rod, he's, again, our, uh, our power, our you know, miraculous great God. And, um, and so we'll see all of those pictures fulfilled in the Lord, which is perfect. Now, there's a mercy seat. So there's a covering that goes over this, this little square box it's got the poles on it again, so they're going to be picking it up and carrying it everywhere they go. Every time the Lord moves somewhere else, they have to pick it up and move all of this stuff. Wherever the Lord stops, then they set up right there. So leave the poles in it, pick it up, and go. So apparently when the glory of the Lord is removed from the tabernacle, then it's okay to go into the Holy Holies. But you don't go in before the glory moves, otherwise you die. So... Um, but once that moved, then they could go in, they could move all of that there, then the glory settles back into it, and then again, everything continues with their worship. So hopefully you can get a picture of that a little bit. And he says, you shall make, verse 17, a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. So again, it's going to go over the box, the top of the box. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them a hammered work made by hand at the two ends of the mercy seat. And so there'll be these cherubim again, a picture of heaven and the angels in heaven. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. So the cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. So they're looking there at the mercy seat. Now, what does this mean? Okay, uh, that's the cover then of this ark, and it's called uh, the mercy seat. Psalm 99 verse 1 says this, The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He is enthroned. Above the cherubim, let the earth shake. So that's a picture in the sense of heaven, but it's also a picture of the holy of holies. So God is dwelling right above the cherubim that are there. And he's right over this mercy seat. Now, again, the mercy seat is where God will cover the sins of Israel once a year as the high priest enters in. He'll go in and he'll have some blood of the lamb with him, and he'll sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat, and God will have mercy over the people, and he will cover their sins. But again, that's not going to work forever, is it? Because it doesn't remove their sins. They got to come back again next year and do the same thing again for the sins of Israel. It's, you know, that time of atonement there, and he's in the, the holy place. So what's the perfect picture? Well, what about when the Lord 
Jesus himself entered into the heavenly glory of the Lord and the cherubims are there and the Lord God himself looks down upon Jesus as he presents himself as the sacrifice once and for all for the sin of man. Now remember, it's for all men. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's not anybody not included in that love of God, the desire to save him. Not every man will receive that uh, gift there, but the sacrifice was for the sins of the world, and God looked down upon that, and he was pleased with it, wasn't he? The bruising of his son. So now it doesn't have to be done again. That's why it's done once and for all, and it's finished. So that's what the mercy seat represents, our, uh, the Lord Jesus as the sacrifice there, the blood of the lamb. And God will have mercy on us. Praise the Lord for that too, right? So Hebrews 9, if you still got your finger there, some of you are like, ah, I pulled my finger. I thought you were done. No, just kidding. Okay, Hebrews 9, verse 11 and 12. Here's what it says. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Actually, it's right there, huh? It's like, ah, thank you. All right. Now, that's a beautiful picture because it, uh, that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews was saying. This has all been fulfilled. So we see this now. They don't understand all of this, but we do. We understand what God's saying. He said, listen, I want to have a relationship with you, covenant with you. But listen, you're going to have to keep bringing these sacrifices because you're a sinful people. But if you will, I will cover you. But one day I'll send my son to be the lamb of God and to be the great high priest who will stand between God and men, and he will represent you before me. And so uh, with his sacrifice, you can now have relationship with me and, uh, and uh, dwell with me. So beautiful picture. I think we're getting the imagery right. And uh, so we, we know this, but the, the Israelites are, are learning more about this. Verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. He hasn't got it yet. God's going to send him down with the tablets, right? Two of them. And uh, there, will, there I will meet with you, and from the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So God says, I'm going to be there. I'll, I'll be with you. And that's where you meet with me. And I'll speak and I'll, I'll uh, uh, guide you and lead you. Now, verse uh, 23. Next, we go to another thing called the table of showbread. He says, you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long and one cubit wide. 18 inches wide, it's not very uh, long, right? And 30, 36 inches uh, long, 18 inches wide. And one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold. So they're building another little table, small table. Make a gold border around it. You shall make for it a rim of, uh, of a hand breadth around it, a hand breadth. And you shall make a gold border for the rim around it. You shall make four gold rings for it and put rings on the four corners, which are on its four feet. Same thing. We're carrying all of this, but I don't want you touching it. Uh, the uh, guys that are carrying it, they're not touching it. They're just carrying it by the poles. And then only the, high, the priests, priestly things, can be interacting with these articles when the Lord says it's, uh, you know, they're fit to do it. Now, um, you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold so that with them the table may be carried. You shall make its dishes and its pans and its jars and its bowls which they're going to have with this particular article, uh, with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. We'll see that he's going to have a special thing for them of how to make the bread. 
and they're going to make 12 loaves, and there's always going to be 12 loaves there representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and uh, that God supplies all of their needs, and that's going to be an image we'll, we'll learn more about later. Then the golden lampstand, the golden lampstand, verse 31. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be one piece with it. Amazing piece of art there. Six branches shall go out from its sides. Three branches of the lampstand from its one side and three branches of the lampstand from the other side. Three cups shall be shaped like almond blossoms. Does anybody know what an almond blossom looks like? Now look out the window, huh? We get to enjoy that, don't we? So, um, like almond blossoms in the one branch, a bulb and a flower and three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch. Uh, so very decorative. A bulb and a flower. So for six branches going out from the lampstand. And in the lampstand, four cups shaped like almond blossoms, its bulbs and its flowers. A bulb shall be under the first pair of branches. So we're having things underneath it as well. Coming out of it and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it. And a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it. Pretty detailed, isn't it? For the six branches coming out of the lampstand, their bulbs and their branches shall be of one piece with it, and all of it shall be one piece of hammered work of pure gold. Then you shall make its lamps seven in number. In other words, there's a center stem as well. And they shall mount its lamps so as to shed light on the space in front of it. It'll always be lit up inside of the holy place, not the holy of holies. And uh, so that light will always be on inside of there as the glory of the Lord is in that place. It its snuffers and their trays shall be of pure gold. They only need the snuffers because they got to turn it out in order to transport it to the next place and then light it back again. But later on, it's going to stay in one place when they come into the temple and the temple is built. It shall be made from a talent of pure gold. So even the snuffers, snuffing out the light, um, um, of pure gold with all these utensils. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. Interesting that you can go to Israel today and the Temple Institute is a group of people that are already preparing to do all of the uh, articles here for the next temple and uh, this rebuilt temple. And they're already preparing all of those articles for it. You can go in. They have them of solid gold, all of these little pieces by their dimensions and they have them prepared. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. Can't find it. But, um, but they're preparing the way here. And it's interesting that the Bible says in the last days, uh, uh, Israel is going to move forward to build their temple again. And, uh, of course, the Antichrist himself will defile it. But uh, they will be doing that uh, again. So you can see that when you go to Israel. Um, so um, interesting picture. Now, what does it mean? What's the lamp? Well, that's Jesus as well. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the one who sustains us. Jesus is also the lampstand, isn't he? He's the light. In fact, the Bible says in John 1, he's the light of the world. And, uh, and he's a light of God that's come down. And so that's who he is. But also we see a picture of him in the book of Revelation. It's pretty awesome. And he's standing there amongst the seven golden lampstands. And, um, and so there's a picture of him that he's the one who sees, of course, all of the church, his own bride. And he knows and he sees everything about that. And so it has to do with him, again, being not only our light, but also seeing and searching. And he knows our hearts, doesn't he? So wonderful picture. But also the same picture of the, all that being woven together in a kind of picture of a um, kind of like stems and a vine. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches and you need to abide in me. And so... Uh, that same picture. Seven is the number of, of course, perfection. Chapter 26. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle. So now we're going to look at the bigger picture of the tabernacle, okay? Which, again, is the building there, that two-room uh, piece of property there, but also even its borders have design as well. So verse 1. 
You shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. Of course, that's royal material, kingly material, which they got out of Egypt. You shall make them with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. So they're going to weave into that things of angels on this tapestry. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain, four cubits. All the curtains shall have uh, the same measurement. So they're, they're making them in strips of four cubits, okay? So six feet wide, and they're putting them, they're making long pieces uh, there. Um, and the Bible says 28 cubits long, and, um, but, but, and then six feet wide. We'll see why in just a second, because each one of these curtains is going to be woven together with the, each panel, and they're going to put all of the panels together, and it's going to be long enough to span all the way over the end of the, the uh, from end to end of the tabernacle and from side to side of the tabernacle, and to drape down on each side as well. And they take the curtains and wrap them around like you're wrapping a present. But if you go on to the inside of this structure that's built there, then what do you see? This is the inside. It's all of this beautiful blue and purple uh, tapestry with angels there. And you go in and it's heaven as you go in because that's what you see on the inside. And it's long enough to drape all the way over from end to end, from end to end both ways and tied together. So that's on the inside that tapestry. So that's what you would see when you walked in. That's all that you would see. And it would look like heaven. Um, five curtains shall be joined to one another, verse 3. And the other five curtains shall be joined to one another. So they're going to put them in two sections. Uh, they're five and five. And so um, 60 feet all together. Uh, you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the uttermost curtain in the first set. And likewise, you shall make them on the edge of the curtain that is uttermost in the second set. He's going to explain how to put it all together and all the rings that will go to fasten it in place. But it's really not to touch the ground. It's to go all the way down to the ground. Um, it's the outer layers that are going to go all the way down and touch the dirt. God is specific over that. Heaven is touching down, but not all the way, right? And so God has come down. He's dwelling uh, here, uh, but it's a, a great imagery as well. So he explains it. You shall make 50 loops in one curtain, and you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set, going all the way around the borders. Loops shall be opposite uh, um, each other. You shall make 50 clasps of gold and join the curtains to one another and the clasps so that the tabernacle will be a unit. It's going to be one piece when they assemble all of it each time the, the tabernacle moves. Take it apart, put it back together. Um, the exterior curtains, now we're going to see there's three more layers. They're all of goat hair, ram skins, and it kind of says like porpoise or sea cows, but I think could be badger skins. But they're all kind of, again, goat hair, ram skins, and then other skins uh, that are there. Then you shall make curtains of goat hair for a tent over the tabernacle. So the first layer underneath, just over the purple layer, uh, that's there is black of these black goats that the Bedouins would have. There. They make this black curtain that goes over it. So you can't see it from the outside. It's covered up, the inside curtain. So um, you shall make 11 curtains in all. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, a little bit longer, right? Two cubits longer. And the width of each curtain, four cubits. The 11 curtains shall have the same measurements. You shall join five curtains by themselves and the other six curtains, putting the two pieces together again, by themselves. And you shall double over the sixth curtain at the front of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is uttermost in the first set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is uttermost in the second set. You shall make 50 clasps of bronze and you shall put the clasps into the loops and join the tent together so that it will be a unit. The overlapping part that is left over in the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that is left over, shall lap over the back of the tabernacle. In other words, it comes all the way over the back. The cubit 
one, uh, on one side and the cubit on the other of what is left over in length of the curtains of the tent shall lap over the sides of the tabernacle on one side and on the other to cover it, which means you're going to have an extra cubit that will touch the ground. Nobody will be able to see in be covering everything all the way down to the ground. So it laps over, and it's long enough to actually come down to the ground and, and, and actually lap over on to the ground. You shall make a covering for the tent of ram skins, dyed red, and a covering of porpoise skins. So they're going to do two more layers. Uh, again, the first one that's there, ram skins, they're going to dye that red. That's the red covering. And then uh, whatever that badger skins or whatever it is will be the third layer. So... But um, it's also going to keep out, I would imagine, a lot of the heat uh, that way in the desert. And uh, so like a Bedouin tent, uh, always remember going to Israel the first time. And uh, coming up into Israel is the first time that we saw Bedouin tents. And uh, now they have little huts and still not much that's there as you come up with the Bedouin tribes are on both sides. But as you drive up, I remember looking over there, <clears throat> I see this. You know, just like the old school, right out of the Bible, big, huge tent, right? I mean, it's a thick, layered tent like that. I mean, it's just out there on the ground in the desert. And then um, alongside of it is a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> Can you imagine? And on top of it was a satellite dish. <laughs> and some of the better ones that have been given the land and stuff, they're, they're, they're pretty wealthy, uh, don't, don't be confused by the tent, right? Uh, look at this, the uh, Mercedes Benz that's outside as well. Interesting. But that's kind of a little bit of the picture here that we see. Now, um, so three layers. And um, uh, they hung them over the top of it that way. Now, what does it mean? Well, just quickly, the inside of it is uh, the picture of heaven. And God in his presence, the inside curtain, and the glory of the Lord that's there. And the outside is wrapped in these skins, you know, of darkness and, and uh, uh, the covering that's over it. it. It's a picture of Jesus in that way, who was God, um, but he wrapped himself in our flesh, didn't he? And, um, and, and again, he, he, he was human, but yet he was God. He was deity. And we see that picture. He was the sacrifice, offering his body, and he gave up his body for us. And, um, but again, um, to usher us into the presence of the Lord. And, and so there's some beautiful imagery there as well. Um, but God wrapped in humanity, wasn't he? Uh, interesting. Verse 15. Then you shall make the boards for the tabernacle of acacia wood. So now we're building the framing. We need the framing board. For the tabernacle, standing upright, 10 cubits shall be the length of each board and one and a half cubits the width of each board. So these pillars that go all the way around the tabernacle are 15 feet high. So this goes up quite a way. It's not a little small thing. It has some great height to it. There shall be two tenons for each board fitted to one another. Thus you shall do for all the boards of the tabernacle. They're going to be the same. You shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side. You shall make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for its two tenons, and two sockets under another board for its two tenons. Now, it just, your mind just thinks about this every once in a while. You're reading through this, and you're going, really? All of that needs to be included? Now, who's laying this out? Is it Moses? saying, hey, we're going to build a tent. I think it would be cool if we had some. No. God's designing it. God knows every detail of it, doesn't he? He's right where everything should be. He's a God of detail, isn't he? He has everything planned. Everything's ordered. Everything's structured. Everything's perfect. And so it's not mundane. It all has point and it all has purpose. It all has function. No matter what God's got us doing, there's a purpose for it, isn't it? got a design and a purpose. He doesn't miss anything. So he sees our lives. He knows where we're at, and he knows where he wants to take us, and God is detailed in that. We're not, but he is. I like the idea that he orders my steps, doesn't he? And he knows those things. And so if we let God have uh, 
things, then we know that um, we can be uh, walking right along with his plan. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, 20 boards, and, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under one board and two sockets under another board. I'm in verse 22, if it sounds all like it's the same. Like, where, where did you, I, I lost you as sockets and boards. Okay. <laughs> for the rear of the tabernacle to the west, you shall make six boards. And again, he's talking about, you know, six along the back, 12 along the side. So he's giving them the layout of where they go and how to space them out as you put the whole thing uh, together. Two boards for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear, they shall be double uh, uh, beneath, and together they shall be complete to its top, to the first ring. Thus it shall be with both of them. They shall form the two corners. There shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. Then you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards, um, um, of, the, of one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the other side. So now you're putting bars on top of the pillars. Five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle and the rear side to the west. By the time they take this down and put it back up and take it down and put it back up, they know all the pieces there. In fact, was anybody here at Shelter Cove and we have the tabernacle, life-size, full thing out here on the lawn? Okay, great. Okay. So... We could put the whole thing out there on the lawn and people could walk through it, but you could see we had to assemble all of it, put it all together. We had to tear it all down, put it all back in the truck, but that's exactly what it was designed uh, to do, to be able to, to move with the Lord as he moves. So, verse 28, the middle bar in the center of the board shall pass through uh, from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold. Again, everything on the inside is gold, 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 except for the tapestry. Um, it's perfect. It's just a, a heavenly picture. As holders for the bars, and you shall overlay bars with gold, then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan, which you have been shown in the mountain. So God was going to burn this into to Moses' heart. And again, he was going to write all of this down later, and they would always know exactly what God uh, wants uh, for all of its dimensions and how to assemble it. Verse 31. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Well, what's this going to be for? We already have a tapestry all over the entire circumference of this tabernacle. It should be made with, a, with cherubim, the work of a skillful work, workman. You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold. Their hooks also being of gold four sockets of silver. You shall hang up the veil under the clasps and shall bring it in the ark of the testimony there within the veil and the veil shall serve for you as a partition between the holy place and the holy of holies. So as we're going to see, the holy of holies is square and then again a rectangle for the uh, other part of the holy place. Now, what are they doing? God's saying, listen, there's going to be a veil between the holy of, uh, place where those articles are and the holy of holies where only the Ark of the Covenant is. You're not going to need light in there because I'm going to be the light in there. So there's going to be a veil there and nobody can go past that. If you get anybody goes past that, you're going to, you'll die immediately. So he's laying uh, all of this out for the curtains uh, there. And then he says... Um, verse 33, you shall hang up the veil under the clasps and bring uh, in the ark of the testimony therein within the veil. So you're going to bring in this ark of the covenant inside of this room. Then you're going to put that, that veil down before my glory comes in as a partition between the holy place and the holy of holies. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony, the, other, the lid, and the holy of holies. You shall set the table... Outside the veil and the lampstand, which we just talked about, table of showbread, lampstand, opposite the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. So as you went into the uh, ark of the, I mean, the holy place, you'd see the, the, the lampstand on the left, and then on uh, the right, you'd see the table of showbread. So whenever you think of the tabernacle, we're going to see this because he's going to camp 
They're all going to camp around it, and they're going to have a design for that too. Three tribes here, three tribes here, three tribes here, three tribes here, and then around it, uh, the tribe, again, of the Levites will be uh, around the center part and in the front, which is always going to be on the east, right? On the east. Again, if you go to Israel, we'll go up on the Mount of Olives, and you'll look down the Kidron Valley, and you'll see the Temple Mount, just clear as day, the big wall that goes all the way across. It's called the Eastern Gate, faces the east. The Lord's going to come, right? Down on the Mount of Olives, he's going to walk down that valley one day at the end of the tribulation. He's going he's to go right through that Eastern Gate. He's going to set up his own um, dwelling place. And he'll dwell here on the earth for a thousand years. And he'll rule and reign over the nations. Uh, so that's a great picture. So always remember that's the east. That's the gate, the door, the front gate on the east. Everything else rotates around it. Okay, we're doing okay. You, got, you all right? A lot of reading. Verse 1, 27. Um, did I finish all of that reading? No? Which verse am I on? 36, 37, Okay. I want to shortchange you here. You shall uh, make a screen for the doorway of the tent, a blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, uh, the work of a weaver. You shall make five pillars of acacia for the screen and overlay them with the gold, their hooks also being gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze uh, for them. So he's talking about when we move from the inside to the outside, the materials are going to change. On us. So verse chapter 27, he says, And you shall make the altar of acacia wood five cubits long and five cubits wide. So now we're talking about seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. A square altar, another altar. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits high. You shall make its horns, there's going to be a horn on each of the corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, all cast together. And you shall overlay it with bronze. So this is going to be bronze on the outside. You shall make its pails for removing its ashes and its shovels and its basins, its forks and its fire pans. In other words, there's going to be a lot of burning going on inside of it, right? Um, you shall make all of its utensils out of bronze. It's called the altar of burnt, burnt offerings. It's, it's going to where you bring your offering and it starts out right there. Sacrificed. And the, uh, the choice parts of the animal go on this burning altar, and it's consumed, okay? So you've got to have all these utensils to break everything down, pull all the ashes out, um, and uh, again, be able to move it. You shall make for it a grating of network of bronze. So they have a bronze grate on the top of it. And on the net, you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall put it beneath under the ledge of the altar so that the net will reach halfway up the altar. So you have halfway down, you have this uh, grate that's there. You shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. Now we're talking bronze. Its poles shall be inserted into the rings so that the poles shall be on two sides of the altar. When it is carried, you shall make it hollow with planks as it was shown to you in the mountain. So shall they make it. It's the way you need to make it. So... What is bronze? Bronze is always a picture of fiery judgment. It's the, it's the, the um, um, metal there that's in reference to fiery judgment where fire consumes the sin offering. That's where it meets, right there at the bronze altar there. Now in Revelation chapter 1, we see Jesus as he's coming down to bring judgment upon the earth at the end of the tribulation and John sees him. And when he sees him there, uh, this picture of him, the Bible says his feet were like burnished bronze and as, as if glowing in a furnace. Why? Because he was coming to, to, to bring judgment and the fire of God upon the earth. So a uh, great picture. Then he says, you shall make the court of the tabernacle, verse 9, on the south side where there shall be hangings for the court of fine twisted linen, 100 cubits long. So now we're looking at the Dimensions of the outer court or the outside fencing. It's 100 cubits long. That's 150 feet long for one side. And its pillars shall be 20 
and there 20 sockets of bronze, so you can have 20 pillars going down the side, hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be of silver. Uh, likewise, for the north side in length, there shall be hangings 100 cubits long and its 20 pillars with their 20 sockets of bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver. For the width of the court on the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits, so that's 75 feet long. 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, okay? That's the dimensions there. It's not, not as big even as a football field, is it? The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. And for the other side, there shall be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen of 20 cubits um, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen of the work of the weaver. So we have, you know, 75 feet across. And then in the center of that, we've got a 30-foot opening that's going to be the main opening that goes into this, this court uh, here. All the pillars around the court shall be furnished with silver bands with their hooks of silver and their sockets of bronze. So a big opening there. A lot of people are going to come in, offer their sacrifices there. The priests will be inside this open area, and they'll be doing all of the sacrifice. And then before they bring all of it into the holy place before the Lord... Some of that's going to go there. And then once a year into the Holy of Holies to meet with the Lord. Verse 20. You shall charge the sons of Israel that, that they bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light to make a lamp, uh, the lamp burn continually. So this is going to be a continued thing that they will always be bringing oil there as an offering there so that the lamp will never go out. So there's an initial um, gift of oil but then later on, they'll have a special oil here of clear oil of beaten olives for the light. And, um, and so that'll burn continually. So if the Lord never moved, and He didn't go anywhere and it just stayed in one place, then that lamp would stay on 24-7. Always be being filled, refilled uh, there um, in the um, place of the Lord. The light never goes out, right? Verse 21, in the tent of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, okay, uh, the tent of meeting outside the Holy of Holies, right, uh, Aaron and his son shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generations for the sons of Israel. So now he's instituting the priesthood. The only guys that are going to be doing this work, Aaron and sons of Aaron and descendants of Aaron. The Aaronic priesthood, right? So it starts out with him. They're put in charge of this. Um, again, um, a Levite, and that's who uh, God is going to use there. Um, but especially Aaron here will be of the priesthood. The other Levites will be helping and doing a lot of things, but the Aaronic uh, priesthood will be doing the work inside of this place. All right, don't panic. Chapter 28, then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. You're a priest before me. You'll be standing right next to my presence. It's a job you're doing right, right uh, before me. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, the two sons we've already known of Aaron, and then also Eliezer and Ithamar, so the four sons, Aaron's sons. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, uh, for glory and for beauty. In other words, we're going to make a beautiful priestly garment for your brother um, because you're not going to stand in my presence and not be adorned uh, the way a high priest should. Somebody is worthy to come into my presence and to be there and minister for me and for, uh, before me, before men. Uh, you need to look good. So we'll see. Uh, it's going to be glorious and beautiful. You shall speak to all the skillful persons who, whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister as priest to me. These are the garments which they shall make, a breast piece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of checkered work, a turban and a sash, 
and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons. They're going to put some kind of like pant type things uh, added to their uh, garments. And that he, uh, he shall minister as priest again to me. They shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen. They shall also make the ephod of gold, of blue. We'll learn about the ephod here in a second. And purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of skillful workmen. It shall have two shoulder pieces joined to its two ends that it may be joined. The skillful woven band which is on it shall be like its workmanship of the same material of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. You shall take two onyx stones. Remember they asked for onyx? Two onyx stones and engrave, engrave them on, the, um, on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and uh, the names of the remaining six on the other stone. They'll be put on one side, uh, each side of their chest according to their birth. As a jeweler engraves the signet, you shall engrave the two stones according to the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in um, figgle tree settings of gold. You shall put the two stones on the shoulder piece of the ephod as stones of memorial for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for a memorial. So what does that mean? Aaron, every time you go in, you bring the whole nation in with you before me. Don't ever forget that. Sad part about it is they forgot it. They got so lax at one point, they just didn't even care of the way they presented themselves before the Lord and to making their lives right before God, before entering in there. And as we're going to see, God finally just kills, kills uh, the and Nadab and Abihu. And uh, so it's no... No uh, laughing matter or thing to be trivial about. You stand before me when you walk in. Uh, you better look right. So you shall make figgle tree settings of gold and two chains of pure gold. You shall make them of twisted cordage work and you shall put the corded chains on the figgle, uh, filig tree, uh, filigree settings. Some of you are seamstress and you guys know all these what this means, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm butchering it. But it must be beautiful because they, they must have known the kind of weaving that they were going to do and corded chains uh, that they're making. You shall make a breast piece of judgment, the work of a skillful workman, like the work of, an, of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. You shall make it. It shall be a square and folded double, a span in length and a span in width, so eight inches by eight inches. You shall mount on it four rows of stones. It's going to have four rows going down um, of three stones each. The first row shall be a row of ruby, topaz, and emerald. The second row of turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. The third row of jacinth, uh, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a burl, an onyx, and a jasper, and they shall be set in gold filigree. The stones shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names. They shall be like the engravings of a seal, each according to his name for the twelve tribes. They're each going to get a stone uh, of their own. So, beautiful picture, but he says, listen, they're going to be represented by stones. Each of them are precious. They're precious stones. Um, here's what's fascinating. When we go to heaven, we're going to see the same imagery. There's these precious stones built in to the picture of what heaven is like, right? We just talked about that um, and the foundations of these precious stones and then the pearls and the gold and all of that. But here's what the Bible says. 1 Peter 2, it says, we, Jesus, it says, coming to him as to a living stone, Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. He's the foundation. He's the cornerstone, isn't he? And he says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a royal priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're living stones built on to Christ. You know, heaven is not going to be about just pretty stuff. 
What makes heaven wonderful and beautiful is, not, is the presence of the Lord. He'll be there. We'll be worshiping with him. But the things that are valuable to the Lord are people. That's what he considers valuable above everything else. Because he paid a great price to redeem man. And it's precious, each, each life, each person. So we got to remember what's important. It's the people around us, right? People that are lost and need Christ. That's what's important to God. That's what he's got his eye on. That stuff doesn't matter. So we want what's precious to God to be precious to us as well. Now, see if we can wrap this up here. You shall make on the breastpiece chains of twisted cordage, work in pure, uh, in pure gold. You shall make on the breastpiece two rings of gold and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastpiece. You shall put the two cords of gold on the two rings at the ends of the breastpiece. So he's talking about how to put all this together, put it all on. You shall put on the other two ends of the cord, two cords on the two filigree settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front of it. You shall make two rings of gold and shall place them on the two ends of the breastpiece. It's going to be a quite a garment, isn't it? On the edge of it, which is toward the inner side of the ephod. You shall make two rings of gold and put them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod on the front of it, close to, uh, to the place where it is joined above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. They shall bind the breastpiece uh, by its rings to the rings of the ephod and a blue, with a blue cord so that it will be on the skillfully woven band of the ephod and the breast piece will not come loose from the ephod. Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a ceremonial uh, before the Lord. So it's going to be right here over his heart. You shall put in the breast piece of judgment the urim and the thummim. We'll talk more about that. A white stone and a black stone. And that is where they would actually be able to go for God and get yeses and nos uh, and answers from the Lord. And so he's got this also with the high priest, speaking directly to the Lord, Urim and Thummim. And they shall bear over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. You shall make the robe of the ephod all blue. There shall be an opening at its top and the middle of it. Around its opening, there shall be a binding of woven work, like the opening of a coat of mail, so that it will not be torn. You shall make on its hem pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material. So at the bottom, the little pomegranates all around on its hem and bells of gold between them all around. So you can have a jingling uh, high priest. He'll be jingling everywhere he goes. A golden bell and a pomegranate and a golden bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe. It shall be on Aaron when he ministers and its tinkling shall be heard when he enters and leaves the holy place before the Lord so that he will not die. So really what that means is the, the pomegranates are not going to keep him and the bells aren't going to keep him from dying. But what it means is if he, if he goes into the holy of holies and it, things aren't right and you don't hear any jingling, you know I killed him. So that's just a way to let you know, okay, he's dead. I don't hear any jingling anymore. So in the future, they'd have to be able to pull them out uh, there because you can't go in to get them, right? So uh, serious business being the high priest, even though you get a pretty robe. Okay. You shall make, also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal, holy to the Lord. You shall fasten it on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban. So it's going to be on the hat there. It's going to have a golden plate there, uh, there to be at the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate uh, with regard to all their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. So again, a representation. You shall weave the tunic of checkered work of fine linen and shall make a turban of fine linen and you shall make a sash, the work of a weaver, for Aaron's sons. So again, some leggings for the sons. You shall make tunics. You shall also make sashes for them and you shall make caps for them 
for glory and for beauty. You shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, and you shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. They stand before me and representing all of Israel. You shall make for them linen breeches, again, which are trousers, to cover their bare flesh. They shall reach from the loins even to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons as they enter the tent of meeting. So you wouldn't be able to see it's a little covering there, like more like shorts. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they enter the tent of meeting and when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they do not incur guilt and die. So serious business. It shall be a statute forever to him and to his descendants after them. Oh. Okay. Who? <laughs> okay. So, we're, yeah, exactly. You got to like, give yourself a hand. I just read all those chapters. Okay. But let's just not forget the image. We're going to close in prayer here. It's God's desire to have us in his presence. But it isn't going to be easy to get there. In fact, it's impossible to get there on our own. Jesus has to fulfill all this. He has to be our great high priest and do it right. He has to fulfill all the sacrifices, go in, and then, again, make everything right so that we can come in before him. He's a holy God, but he wants to open heaven to all of us, doesn't he? He wants us to be with him in heaven. This is the picture, not of an earthly dwelling with God, but a heavenly dwelling with God. He's prepared the way that we can be with him. Now, Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, hasn't he? That's our home. I know you might have a lot of troubles tonight, a lot of struggles, a lot of things going on in your life, but let's get the bigger picture. We've been invited to heaven to dwell with God forever. No sin, no pain, no tears, no any of that. And he says, um, all of that comes through my son. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but through me. He's the open door, our great high priest. And now God says, come, come to me. Uh, all that desire, come. I mean, that's the end of the Bible, right? God says, I'm inviting you. I want every man to come. And so we close with that tonight. Lord, we thank you again. A lot of verses there, a lot of detail. We don't understand all of it. But I know it's all perfect. It's all exactly what you want. And it's the image, Lord, of, of our approach to you and your son's fulfillment of everything that was needed to make us holy in your sight so we could tabernacle with you. We could be at home with you, God. Thank you for loving us so much to do all of that for us. And now the covenant has already been fulfilled through your son. All we have to do is receive it. We could do that tonight if there's anybody here who doesn't have a personal relationship with your son. They can believe on him, that he has prepared the way, trust in his death and his resurrection, and that now heaven is open for us, Lord, to come to you, Father, and to be with you, and you want us to come, and any man can come, and so I pray they would do that tonight. We love you. We thank you for all of this. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.